Hey, how's it going? <clears throat> so I want to talk about something that I have noticed for a long time, and I feel like it just doesn't really get addressed. And I feel like the reason why it doesn't get addressed is kind of the root of the problem. Um, I wrote some stuff, and I'm just going to read it instead of just rambling. Okay, here we go. Maybe it's because I would like to see us all unify and stop being against each other in all of the ways that we do. Not all of us, but many. Obviously, I am not the first person to have this wish and concern. It's an eons old ideal and in the areas where it most needs to happen, it consistently has not. I mean geographically and emotionally, even intelligently and consciously. I have some thoughts as to why that makes a lot of sense to me. But it's complicated. So many aspects exist that are not collectively agreed upon that I feel like we're not accepted, are not accepted rather, because of a kind of anti-awareness campaign and a coordinated system of distraction, overstimulation, and an enforced uh, ignorance. Wow, I could write that a lot better. Yeah, so yeah, an enforced ignorance that prevents those many disbelieving amongst us, it steers us off uh, discourse reflexively, mainly because no one was saying they felt any of these things. In retro, hell, many they may have. People say behaviors are learned. <clears throat> the implication being at home from whomever raised you a couple of things as a child no one was really openly talking feelings I mean at, when I was a child had they the tools to process them I mean yeah but that's just not what, the way it was done in the 60s like it, actually <clears throat> I'm breaking away from the script here but In the 60s, there were a lot of um, sort of psychological experiments that the public took part in, like uh, communal groups and uh, just like uh, approaches to psychiatry, I guess, or psychology being mainstreamed. Um, and I feel like it was a lot of the 60s and 70s where it started coming into prominence and acceptance and the, you know, the idea that, you know, our personal problems and by extension societal ills could be dealt with if we could just talk to somebody with some certification on how to treat mental difficulties. Anyway, <clears throat> back to it. I can find my place. Oh, okay. In a world that still interpret a lot of things differently, uh, I'm not sure that we had the tools to process feelings the way we do today. The thing is, the other thing is that there were always manifestations of this dissatisfaction. Jim Crow laws, segregation, you see where I'm heading? <laughs> Hangings and public violence that went on, was cheered on, urged on because we love blood support. It's coming back out into the open today. <clears throat> My feeling is that nobody alive today is responsible for what happened far back in yesterday, but we're still affected by it, all in the echoes of it today. That was badly constructed, but I'm not stopping to fix it. A perpetuation of speech and attitudes that were in 
a hibernation state quietly underlying I am what I don't know what that uh oh shoot I think I might have misnumbered my pages I did I am I am acutely aware of the irony of the one-sided and myopic behavior of the white people, so protective of their children's self-esteem. Never have I heard these same people lament for the feelings of the kids that resemble the <laughs> formerly oppressed, the descendants of slaves. I have heard no conversations about how learning the history made us black kids, how learning the history made us black kids feel. That proves the lie that racism against black people doesn't exist. We don't even get to participate in the discussion. This is not a typical when it comes to relations. There are plenty, some, that don't participate in the construct at all and if they are successful, can completely dis dissociate from the dynamic. <clears throat> Many are not in the same space as that. There's no changing any mind. Oh, there's no changing any mindset, not anymore than and and there's no changing any mindset any more than an addict can be moved to sobriety until they're ready. A deeply complex arc to navigate, you know, getting clean from addiction. Not unlike finding a peace in the matter of wearing the unresolved conflict on our bodies, as in white skin and black skin. <clears throat> That'll take a deliberate mindset, a commitment to elevate our own consciousness. Nothing so simple, not something we've yet been able to just do. Anyway, I can't help but notice what the wearers of a white skin experience as opposed to the wearer of a black skin looks like. I'm not going to generalize and say white people don't get followed in stores, but I do wonder if it can be as easily and correctly assumed to have been true of all of them the way it is with us. Because I don't... <laughs> I think all people that are uh, perceived to be black Not even going to go there right now, but I think we've all been followed in stores. I do, it doesn't matter if you don't believe in racism as a black person and you feel like it doesn't affect you and it's not real. Great, good for you, highly edited, elevated thinking, but but you, you can't count on the people working in the department store at the mall or wherever the store is located not to be conspicuously paying attention to you or just literally following you around, which I get it, you know, theft control, but personally, when I go in a store, I'm either going there to work or I'm going in there to buy something. I'm not a thief, so I don't appreciate being followed around because you go in there, and when I say you, I mean me, I go in expecting to make a purchase that is my mission for even going there. Otherwise, I wouldn't touch the place. I don't really enjoy the experience. Probably because I've been followed. Because it, you know what it feels like? It feels like someone takes one look at you, having just laid eyes on you and decided you're a thief. You're a bad person. That feels terrible. I wish people would have it immediately reflected back at them when they do it because... Why would you make such a terrible assumption about somebody you have never even experienced in your life before? Sorry. <laughs> kind of got away from me. 
<clears throat> I'm not going to generalize. And, okay, I already read that. Oh, going to go out on the limb. Uh oh, now I lost my place again. Oh, I see. Whoa. Yeah, I lost my... I got, how do I get out of order? Okay, well... Let me see here. This is important. This I should have gotten in early on. Let me see if I can find where I left off on that. Oh, here we go. So, um, I'm going back to the part about the enforced ignorance that prevents those many disbelieving among us from seeing uh, past all that stuff to what I'm talking about. Uh, it steers us off and discourages curiosity. Uh, don't look over there because there's nothing to see here. I ended up watching an episode of the Bill Maher after show Overtime, which is something that it's it's an anomaly. <laughs> I'll put it that way. I used to watch Bill Maher. I have never thought he was funny, but I did think that he was thought provoking what he had to say. He, it, we all evolve. I evolved away from caring about what he had to say. But I watched it yesterday just for the heck of it. I did not know what they were going to be talking about until I clicked on it. And it was um, David Hogg, who is a survivor of the Parkland school shooting and an activist. You know, to I'm not sure what he can do in regard to school shootings, but I think that's his area of acti activity. Uh, Joe Scarborough, who is a former... I think Florida senator who has a and and he's had a show on MS, MSNBC for a long time. He's had two, so um, he's one of the hosts of Morning Joe, which is he's his name is Joe. You you get it. Uh, and the third person was. I do not remember, but what I do remember, it was four white guys talking about black stuff, <laughs> and it was, it's always weird, but it is what got me on this subject, is that they were, uh, well, here, let me read. The subject was some something else, but the conversation veered into white guilt that stems from being the recipients of the reverb of history. Well, it's not just reverbing on white people. It's also the whole other equation of the black people. That always gets minimalized, minimized or something so that it's not important enough to talk about. And I mean, honestly, it, there's some talk, there's plenty of books, there's plenty of history, but coming from like black people, there's a lot there's a lot of out there's a lot of views on the subject there's sort of a monolithic monochrome view uh, of from the white people i will con and, and by the way let me just interject here obviously i'm not just black <laughs> there are i have like my mom is white was white <laughs> uh I also have Native American ancestry, but if you look at me, you don't see all of that. I think you just see, like, a black or, like, a mixed black. You know, it depends on who you are, but even if you are, like, a friendly person to races, you're still going to look at me and get that impression. <laughs> it's just on the surface, but surface can be very superficial, not very deep. So, anyway... Um, the subject veered into white guilt. The discussion being had was between all white men, young to old in age range, but as an apparent black person, I have a different perspective. Three of the four re were resentful of the fact that history has taught 
as wait <laughs> wait me wait men <laughs> stealing the land and destroying cultures and the native people along the way there's reams and reams of history depicting this so I mean I don't know how you think you get out of it <laughs> It's well documented what the white conquerors were doing, or the Europeans, which we generally assume to have been Caucasian. So anyway, uh, they were upset that their kids would be made to feel bad and guilty for what people who looked like they do did, in, you know, all those hundreds of years ago. Regardless of whether they're the true descendants of the original colonizers and slaves today, they, if you're here and you're white, that's what you're going to get stuck with. So, I mean, I do understand it's not just black people that get looked at and then, like, assumptions just immediately apply to them. I get that that also happens to white people. I just am saying the discussion is not an equal discussion. Like, both sides are not equally heard on the matter. So, um, I feel like it's disingenuous that, uh, that that's the case. That, um, well, I mean, we today are seriously not res responsible for what happened before but we still live with implications of it because I'm going to have a black perspective and there's a white perspective and we're not going to necessarily know the intimacies of those perspectives we, we have to talk to each other and make these things known but we have to get to a place where it's not an adversarial thing because Here's the deal. I can just get rid of all of this and just say that yes, we encounter these things. There are ruts that we have that are our belief systems about the matters. There's distortions. There's extenuating circumstances that actually have nothing to do with any of it that affects it. But the bottom line is, is the wounds from the colonizing days and the slavery days and everything that led up to that, like the basic mass kidnapping of people and treating them like just objects that they can do anything with. I, I really loathe the way censorship is taking over everywhere, but I don't think I need to explain what happened. I mean, when black people were stolen from Africa by the paler Caucasians, what you ended up with people was people that looked like me. So, it, but not like, you know, anyone was asking for consent. Also, they were kidnapped and had become property at that point, which I don't know about you, but if you think about it, I don't want that done to me. <laughs> so all the way today when those things no longer openly happen or don't happen in that particular way, because I think there's still a, just a, a healthy slavery market, human trafficking market, but it just, it looks different today. It's very much sort of undercover, but also right in front of us. We're just not realizing what we're looking at. But that's a whole other subject. Ah! This one, though, I think maybe the key to unraveling the discord between the two races of Caucasian and Black is to honestly look at what happened then as something that happened way back then and the fact that we still have problems with each other today just on sight 
hi we haven't healed anything we haven't fixed anything and maybe if we did I mean maybe it could go viral and then like the same kind of problems that people have with the other races everybody has some kind of issue it seems like with some other race like it's just our thing to find somebody else to blame stuff on and not actually take any responsibility for our participating in it for our role in the same thing so <clears throat> i'm not here to like yell at people and blame people because there are in both camps behaviors that don't help a damn thing about this like you you're not helping straight up if you're perpetuating the stuff that makes us be like against each other and sometimes to the point of violence you're not helping in my opinion but i mean <clears throat> when i see when i say i would like to see us unify that's what i mean and it doesn't mean necessarily going to each other's houses although that would heal so much because we have a lot of ideas I think I mean I I'm, I'm just gonna talk about what I have been confronted with by people who obviously have like a whole scenario set up about people that they have not really talked to about what they think or what they question what they're curious about there are just like these rules and roles that we just talk, we just go in them and don't ask questions but then react to stuff and it's like it's non-productive i feel like you can't really fix things and and, and that might mean different things to different people like i want to fix it so that we can find a way to get along other people might want to fix it in the way that it'd be more expedient and facile for them to just get rid of the problem the problem being the people and that's not really i mean if you're talking about like getting rid of people it, it starts with like moving them places and just goes downhill from there so I don't think that is the answer, but I do think that the feelings that the people that you don't hear talking about stuff, who you don't, are not hearing their side, that could be a problem as far as, it just creates misunderstanding and it takes a little bit more from us to not just be all cheese a nigger well you know <laughs> that silly word has gotten so powerful and it can just shut things down it can shut down operations of a business it can shut down someone's job because of it because they got because they got called it and complained about it because of everything it comes with. It's not just a silly sounding little word. It has a whole framework of behavior that supports it. So if it were up to me, I would have no one calling anybody that. But then there's the black people that have decided that they're gonna make it their own and somehow that's better. But I've been called that by family all my life and I've always hated it. Don't call me that. I don't have good associations with it. Please respect my wishes, but they don't. <laughs> They'll just keep calling you anyway. And it's like, I feel like you don't even realize the hammer you're hitting me with. And even though I'm saying, please don't hit me with the hammer, you're just all, ha ha, shut up, nigga. I don't like that. <laughs> I don't want that from my family. I don't want that from strangers that look like me where a familial inform in familial implication or a familial uh, connection is implied just because you know 
two people happen to be black. <laughs> but that, we could, sometimes, you know, strangers couldn't be further apart from people geographically, emotionally, mentally. One of the things I think that would help is that we stop blaming each other for stuff that happened so long ago and instead look at it for what it actually is and it is that we're still holding emotions and beliefs, I guess, a little bit or something from events from 200 years ago, which, hi, we living in the past is in so many ways not productive for your life, not helpful in general. I mean, living in the past messes you up trying to live in the future, makes you anxious trying to figure out what's going to happen and predict and guess. The best place to be to feel the best, in, in my opinion, is to just hang out in the present, like deal with what's happening right now. And I'm not saying you can't like think about the past or the future but the past is gone you can't like do anything about it you and I mean past from hundreds of years ago and, and past from last week kind of like it happened let it go <laughs> I don't know it just is like uh safer to stay in the present moment and deal with what's happening right then and there instead of trying to get away from the subject I feel like is what happens and what about is I'm like god that is like such a waste of time such a deflection and uh that'll happen because not everyone is ready to deal with these things it is a difficult subject I feel like um but I I think we make it more difficult than it need be. I forgot to have you take a look at my signs as I'm just chattering away here. Because that's what I do. I'll start thinking about something and get a wild hair and ruminate on it and think about it. But, you know, then I go the extra step of sharing it with you because... Particularly for this subject today, I know it's hard to approach because people have feelings. Everyone I've talked about, whoever they happen to be, along the scales of what those people could be, everyone's got a different viewpoint. Everybody's had a different experience. And, wow, I think we need to understand that first before anything when we are talking to each other. So, I don't know who else is ready to deal with this in that way, but I know I am. So, while I was thinking about this yesterday and just kind of doing my thing, I was shuffling my cards, my new cards, and one flew out. So, I'm going to share that with you, and it was this card that, it doesn't have a title, but it has a picture of a gift, and... I will read what it says. Look inside yourself all you want. You already are abundance. Resources, your wish is granted. Here's my wish. Look inside what I was just talking about because I think we just get caught up in what appeals to us, what we were ingrained with in our upbringing and surroundings you know we can explore things further than we do we get to a point where I think it gets difficult or stressful and it's like we don't want to deal with things any more than that but that's kind of crazy because we have to because we can't really like step out of our lives and go someplace else while difficult stuff is happening. I mean, you can dissociate for a little while, but you gotta come back. So, what I feel like we haven't understood about 
learning how to, uh, like just learning about what's different about each other, um, un un better understanding those things that we're just like, oh, that is so weird, or that is so foreign, like just in whatever way it repels you. I want to say that if it's something that people are doing and it's not killing them and making them ill, it probably ain't going to hurt you. Like, why would we have a fear of that type of other people? But, like, like there's space aliens. Like, there's that kind of fear is what I feel like they they think of the differences. Like, and it's like, that's, that's just not, I don't think, true. <laughs> like, I don't think we're that different. And also, I know that from experience, different, trying different things and thinking different ways is not going to hurt you or hurt anybody in most cases as long as it's just left to thought and words. <laughs> like, those generally will not pierce you and require medical care. And also, once you approach those things... You get a new perspective. You receive a new outlook on things and people. That's got to be good. That can't hurt. So, I'm going to finish up here, but I'm just going to see. I don't know if anything's going to pop out, but maybe there's something more to be said on the so Oh, there's one. Oh, there's two to be said on the subject that I was just, that I've been talking about. Okay, so the next card I pulled was. If light is in your heart, oh, here, I'll let you see it. It's a little house. It kind of looks like a Christmas decoration. Um, I think I'm going to be saying that a lot about this deck. If light is in your heart, you will find your way home. Use your intuition. Return to the past. Be your own teacher. If we return to the past, what can we learn that's going to help us today? Well, I think that remains to be seen, but I think that it is a hopeful prescription for the future. I feel like it's what I was saying. You have to maybe go into a house that's not your own that's very different from your own that you might look at and go i wouldn't do it that way however once if you are invited inside if you are allowed to come in please take the opportunity to receive new information new perspectives, a new outlook on those other people and their life in like what they're really like, like when they're at home and they're themselves, they go in and they like take showers and eat food and ha have entertainment, do homework, do work, you know, whatever it is they do, all of the same stuff as other people. This one says also... Use your intuition, return to the past, and be your own teacher. What will your intuition today do to help you look at the past that's connected to that today? What can we get from that that, um, that we haven't already seen and deployed against each other like what can we get out of it to see like oh maybe like we don't have to perpetuate that there's better ways to do stuff today and also you go into the house of a stranger and you expect strange things but what you'll find is different recipes but pretty normal same stuff as you and then this will be the last card forget safety live where you fear to live Take a chance, dare to dream, risk pays off. Go inhabitate with these other people that you don't know about, that you maybe are fearful of, that you will maybe cross the street from. And I say, 
everything is not to be feared. You might find um, a lot of joy and laughter and reasons to kick up your heels, dance. Um, I, I, it's so weird to me, like, we're all people. Why would we be so fearful of each other? I mean, definitely. Ah! <laughs> Speaking of fearful, there are those of us that will incur fear on others amongst us, but we're not all that way. In fact, in, in the totality, like per capita, there's more nice people that are going to be helpful and loving and okay come to your rescue <clears throat> so also it says forget safety right at the beginning you can have an intellectual knowledge and understanding of what is safe and what is unsafe but if you're constantly wrapped in fear and paranoia then every you, you're like a hammer every person you see is a nail to be afraid of to across the street from to avoid talking to take a chance dare to dream there are situations when risk pays off i mean you don't have to be foolish but going up and talking to someone or sharing a lunch table with them or even having a conversation in the line at the dry cleaner or the bank. If you're afraid of that, baby, sweetie, honey, don't be. You, you should still be able to just talk to someone. It doesn't have to be deep. It doesn't have to be like a big deal, but complete avoidance gives the other person ideas about I mean, don't think you're the only one that's fearful. <laughs> don't think you're the only one, okay, that doesn't know what the unknown holds. It is good, though, to get out of your shell. <laughs> Go see what's in other shells. Use your intuition. It'll, it'll serve you if there's something that you need to be wary of. You will get some form of warning. Your body will tell you in various ways. So I think it's time that, you know, we drop the fear about this stuff. And part of the fear is anger. Fear and anger are going to come in the same column. That is not the love column. That is not the acceptance column. That is not the allowing people to be who they are and don't resent them column as far as the kids being made to feel bad and feeling guilty I don't know if I conveyed it right in what I wrote there but I often feel like it is the adult talking the children do have to hear that do you have to learn that fear learn the resentment and prejudices but <clears throat> It is not the fault of the black people who still can feel re repercussions of those days of separation and uh, what do you call it when it's segregation. There's, we can feel echoes of that. We've learned about it. There's movies about it. We're really don't ever, uh, we're not ever allowed to forget it really. And uh, I, I just feel like because of the way the country has been run from the beginning, the majority authority types have always been white. And they have a, I have to say the majority of them have a certain outlook on who people are and how they should be treated. And that has been kind of like the way that it just goes along. It's baked into our systems. That's the systematic racism that people talk about. And it's been under attack like I grew up when the civil rights era was kind of taking place the changes leading up to the changes that's about the time I was born and so <clears throat> growing up I saw like a more positive progression kind of away from that and 
just recently people that want to go back in time like have the de the civil rights act has been consistently under attack and incrementally deconstructed and the women's you know uh the women's equal rights are just well they're not like there's you know what happens to the women if they get pregnant now oh my god you can be like made a criminal if you have a miscarriage you think somebody has that much control over their body that they cannot have a miscarriage that's like like arresting a, a woman for having a baby with down syndrome there's two ways to look at that. Yes, you did sign up for that. That this is exactly the life that you wanted. And then the second way is, it's like, don't. Everyone has signed up for something. Everyone has some kind of life. There's going to be happiness. There's going to be difficulties. Some of us choose a really, really difficult path, but. <clears throat> Nearly everything can be flipped if you accept, if you can learn to love. It's really a perspective-based kind of decision-making system. And we can go either way, but what do we really want? Do we want to be at each other's throats forever and in fear of each other? I mean, I'm, this is, I'm going to finish up here, but... I had a thought while I was doing this, and it's like, I'm not a gun person. I don't really understand the gun people. Like, you want to, I, you're fearful and you want to protect yourself. You have possessions and family that you want to protect. That I understand. That's sort of something that we're all, that's, you know, baked into us. But when you need five guns and everybody is something to be fearful of. I think that something went haywire there. Because I don't feel that way. I mean, I am cognizant of the same type of threats that could potentially happen, but I don't spend my life in fear of them. I'm not, like, arming myself to protect myself against this imaginary horde of, of evildoers. Like, it's just us buying into, pin that buying into a paranoid system that just manipulates us. Well, who's driving the manipulation in that system? I bet they sell guns. I bet that they pay politicians to do what they want so that they can keep selling the guns that lead to the horrible tragedies. That is why that David Hogg kid was even on that show that's why we know about him is because he was in a situation where guns came into play and caused a lot of death and heartache and reverberations from that. So um, that's like a whole other thing that's out there throbbing. And then we still, some of us in America are still going through this Civil War thing and, <clears throat> you know, uh, whatever like what came after the revolutionary war where we got gained independence from england where we're just like snatching up people and bringing them over here to work like horses and oxes and things and you could say that the people that got snatched up have some feelings themselves about all of these things but um those don't really get publicized, and when they do, let's see, what was the latest instance? Is Ta-Nehisi Coates talking to Ezra Klein about Gaza, about being, well, I think it was Ezra Klein, about being over there and seeing, he can understand the viewpoint of the Palestinians, as can I. It's not really a race thing, but it kind of is symbolically because... They're like the blacks there uh, next to Israel. And uh, it's that whole conflict is so bizarre to me. But 
I'm not going to get into that quagmire. But the point is, is um, in order to like repair our racial differences, I think we have to see them in a different way. You know, like our perception, I think, still tries to live in the 1700s and the 1800s. And it's like, no. We can't do that and live in the present. And we have present stuff to worry about. Why are we dragging all this garbage from the past, the ugly past? It was a war. We have to at least accept that there were two sides of the matter that was a disagreement. And the fighting and the wars, that that doesn't fix stuff because we just end up having them again. So we, we need a different perspective, I think. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you and good night.